Welcome to Rock and Roll Cars, in which we explore some truly iconic rock and roll motors while taking a light-hearted and affectionate look at the key motoring experiences of a few quite familiar music stars. On a special bill tonight, we focus on Rolls-Royce with the Wraith British Music Collection and a unique access to John Lennon's psychedelic phantom. Interspersed with these mouth-watering beauties, we talk motors with Paul Hardcastle. I took it out on the Saturday night and I smashed the crap out of it. And the rather brilliantly eccentric John Otway. So I said to my roadie, chase that car. Let's kick off by asking our guests to introduce themselves. My name's Paul Hardcastle. Um, I suppose the most famous thing I'm known for in the UK, at least, is 19. I'm a pop star with two hit records and a movie. Went to number one in 1985. It was number one all around the world. Um, we sold nearly seven million records of it. My first hit record was in 1977. And what it did do was it actually kick-started um, Simon Fuller's career off as well, because he was my manager at the time. So there was a long period of time which I refer to as the hitless years. And um, I had a second hit in 2002. So every time you see that famous red one nine, you know, that's basically where it all started from, from that one little record. I bought some champagne to go when I bought my, had my first hit to drink when I had my second. And after 15 years, somebody said, champagne doesn't last that long. Oh dear. Okay, moving forward, swiftly on. <laughs> Did you pass your test easily? I could say yes, and I'd love to say yes, but I'd be lying. I've asked a lot of people if they would get into a car if I was driving it. So I'm not going to lie. No, I didn't. I failed on, I think it was two things. And I... all of them have said, no way. I didn't stop in time when he whacked the, 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 the newspaper on the thing. I wasn't looking. <laughs> I wasn't even concentrating, really. I just thought I'd passed. I thought I was maybe, maybe I was too cocky. I think, if you actually watch me on stage, I think you will perceive a sort of a, some sort of lack of coordination. Um, so, no, I, I, I made it the second time, though. And so I think, well, if they're not going to, why should I get into a car with myself driving? And on to cars. Do you like them? I do like cars. Um, you know, new ones, old ones. Only two. And they're at both ends of the spectrum, really. I started um, off um, with, with a, a Triumph 2.5 PI you know, back in 1977, I think it was. A 1949 Bentley and a Sinclair C5. So I passed my, my test in Tottenham and it was raining. And I remember coming home and I thought, you know what, I can drive a car now. And I had this 400 RD Yamaha and I took it into this place and I, it was like a second-hand car dealer, dealership. And I, I don't know why, but I just swapped my RD400 for a Triumph 2.5 PI. I got the Bentley because um, I couldn't drive, um, but I'd just done this deal with Polydor after my first hit, and they'd given me loads and loads of money. And considering I was only earning about £12 a week, when I looked at the petrol, I put a fiver in it, you know, and the bike, it would last me, say, like, you know, a week. This thing got me, like, about eight miles. So I remember an accountant's meeting and um, me and the manager were sort of sat there, and the accountant, who didn't know that I couldn't drive, said, I think you should both buy a car. So I quickly swapped it with a friend who had an older car, but it was a little Vauxhall Viva. Now, the um, manager that could drive and was taking the merchandising man but bought a Ford Cortina estate. Well, I went to look for the sort of car I wanted. I'm sure a car John would like is the first of our rock and roll cars this week, the Rolls-Royce Wraith. I'm sat here today in one of nine very, very special Rolls-Royce Wraiths. This is the Wraith inspired by British Music Collection, a collection of extraordinary motorcars. 
commissioned in collaboration with some of Britain's greatest music icons. We went around the world meeting some of the great sort of musicians in, in rock music legend um, and sat down with them and our designers to create these really, really beautiful expressions of their own musical legacies. So names like Dame Shirley Bassey, Sir Ray Davis, Roger Daltrey and Mike McKinnery, the, uh, the great album artwork of the Tommy. They actually created two cars between them, the Who and the Tommy car. Ronnie Wood, of course, famous for the Rolling Stones and the Faces. Working with close collaboration with our, our bespoke designers, each rock legend really, really got into the process and, and really began to understand what it is you can change about a Rolls Royce, how you can tailor it to existing tastes, lifestyles, and in this case, to celebrate their own musical legacies. The umbrella for Sir Ray Davis's car, just engraved around, around the top of it for occasions when it's not a sunny afternoon. There's still a great bit of British humor and something Sir Ray I know he enjoyed enormously. We have handwritten lyrics, so lyrics from Sunny Afternoon and one or two of his other songs beautifully hand engraved into the, uh, into the door flights. And perhaps one of my favourite pieces is the headrests, where we've been able to use embroidery to create these rather graphical um, illustrations of, of iconography from these, these rock stars' careers. Because these cars will only ever exist as, as individual motor cars for collectors. We'll never make more of these. So, in the case of Sir Ray Davis, hand built in Goodwood, England, and commissioned by Sir Ray Davis, one of one. I, I think Rolls Royce has had this, this long association with rock and roll. You know, the great musicians that, have, that are so famous for Rolls Royce ownership, whether that's John Lennon, Keith Moon, Elvis Presley. It's such a wonderful celebration of, of, of that sort of legacy that I think people can't help but be completely compelled by it. Back to the earth and more ordinary motoring. What was next, Paul? Uh, a, a GXL um, two-litre Cortina. Um, I remember that very well because um, I'm still am a, a big Hawkwind fan from back in the 70s. You know the sort of the Space Cadet boys, and I remember having this big mural on the back of, of my GXL, and everyone knew me for it. That's the guy with the Hawkwind mural, you know. Um, and it was a bit of a cheat because what I did, I got a poster and I put the poster on it and then I just lacquered over it. I remember I was in the West End of London, um, somewhere near Regent Street, sitting outside a cafe, you know, drinking an expensive drink, as you would do if you got a big deal with Polydor. So after the Cortina, a um, friend of mine had this Triumph Stag and I really wanted it. And I had like a B&O system that I went out and I sold that. Any, any way I could get my hands on some money, you know, beg, steal or borrow, I did to get this Triumph Stag. And this Bentley went past, it's 1949, beautiful Bentley. And as it went past, I noticed this for sale sign in the back. And I was so proud of it, it was a white Triumph Stag. And I took it out on the Saturday night and I smashed the crap out of it. So I said to my roadie, chase that car, get that number. So he ran down the road, got the number, we phoned it up and I sent, um, sent my roadie to go and buy the Bentley. I hit a friend of mine that had stopped at a zebra crossing and I was sort of maybe being a bit leery. She goes, hey, yeah, you know, what do you think of this car? Well, all of a sudden I look back, there's a big white Mark II Cortina in front of me. It stopped my mate, I just wrote his car off, wrote the front of the stag off. And the great thing about the Bentley was, because um, I couldn't drive, I needed somebody to drive me around in it. Not a good day, to say the least, really. It wasn't difficult to find somebody to, to drive you around, because I just sort of say, look, if you take me there, I'll lend you the car for the weekend. As I said, I've always been a biker. And it's good having roadies. I mean, that's their job, isn't it, to, dri to drive you around. And you just don't have to worry about how many beers you have, do you? I hit a car at nearly 90 miles an hour that pulled out, pulled out of a uh, side road. And then you'd say, obviously, why was he doing 90 miles an hour in a 30? Well, unfortunately, I was a bit crazy. But that taught me a lot of lessons, you know, and... I guess, so I just thought, you know what, this is, this is a bit too dangerous. So the next thing, what did I get? I had um, 1600E Cortina, which around that time for me was one of my favourite cars. And they found that it was sort of um, a very successful car to sort of like turn, you know, turn up at um, girlfriends and for the parents to sort of see, see new boyfriend turning up in the 1949 Bentley. Loved it, loved that car. Um, you could actually get it off the, off the scale. I didn't have the Bentley for that long. I'd have probably had it for a lot longer if I'd have had more hits more quickly. Fantastic car, and I've still got one. I've, I've got a really lovely condition one at the moment. 
but the flops kept sort of <laughs> kept coming. It's a different experience, obviously. You know, you sort of have to sort of think about stopping. You know, maybe sort of like five minutes before you would in say a, a normal up-to-date car, but it's still good fun. The Polydor Advance that I'd got um, got smaller and smaller as um, I tried to tour America. I've got a Bond bug, fantastic condition Bond bug. They're the old sort of things that I keep in my garage. I mean, obviously, I've got newer cars as well, but them, them two things, they, they, every time I sort of look at them, they do make me smile. And the Bentley wasn't actually that cheap to run. Um, and it came to the point when, um, unfortunately, I, I had to sell it. The, uh, the, the bright orange cheese is like, it's shaped like that. Fantastic car. I mean, it was, you know, there's, there's not many of them around, and I've got a really, really good condition one. But it was a bloody good two years, though. And, I mean, I really seriously, seriously enjoyed posing around in, in, in the Bentley. Coming up in part two, John Lennon's psychedelic Rolls-Royce Phantom Five. Paul does some name-dropping. I happened to meet um, Dave Gilmore out of Pink Floyd. And John gets thirsty. I mean, I drink a lot of beer. Welcome back, and getting back to car histories. Did success lead to better cars? And when you sell seven million records, you, you can sort of go up the scale a little bit. You don't sort of have to sort of stick to the sort of mini. You know, um, I, the first thing I went out and bought was um, a brand new Lotus Esprit Turbo. And interestingly, I mean, as I mentioned, the manager bought the Ford Cortina Estate and I bought the Bentley. A few years later, when he had to sell the Ford Cortina estate, it was worth um, about a quarter of the amount of money he'd paid for it. My 1949 Bentley had actually made a profit. I, I liked that car, but driving it around town was just the worst thing in the world. So I, I, I think I had that for about five months, and then I swapped it in for a, a new XJS Jaguar. I think it was £2,990, um, I think. Um, in fact, I've still got the uh, the sign that was in the back of the uh, of the Bentley, the for sale sign. So. But then um, I was out in the south of France, and I happened to meet um, Dave Gilmore out of Pink Floyd. <laughs> it's the only thing that I've got left of the Bentley. <laughs> and then he was just telling me about Nick Mason and all these cars, and I thought, wow, Ferrari. That sounds that sounds all right. Oh, it's tragic. I mean, bearing in mind, I mean, I did think it was a rock and roll car, and I just happened to look over the balcony of where, where, where we were staying in south of France. And this guy pulled up in this little 328 GTS. Oh, it was sort of silver and black and, you know, and people did sort of think I, I did look rock and roll being driven around in it. And I just thought, that is the best car I've ever seen in my life. And then the people who bought it sprayed it white and turned it into a wedding car. I got rid of the Jag, got the, got the, the Ferrari, um, and we have still got it. I mean, that was like 30 years ago, it's done, Four and a half thousand miles. <laughs> Isn't that awful? I've got, um, I've got a Bentley, which I think is my favourite car. I mean, I've spent years and years now trying to find out where it is so that I can buy it back. I think because it ticks all the boxes, it's fast, but it's also very, very comfortable. Partly to sort of prove that I haven't learnt anything over all these years. And if you want to know the registration, it's LTU287 just in case anybody spotted it. And I don't think there's anything else that would actually beat that, to be honest with you. You know, a saloon that does 194 miles an hour, you know, it's, it's quiet as anything, it, it looks lovely, it's the convertible one. Well, I've now got a nice drive here, and, I mean, it would just look really nice parked outside. In fact, it's quite funny, because I, like, I don't like the, 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 normal, the normal Bentley um, GT, the, 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 the hard top one. I think it looks a little bit too... I don't know, abrupt, I think, with the soft top, it, it seems to soften it up a little bit. I mean, I wanted to be a pop star from the age of nine years old. So, say, it's not really that I, I always take the roof off, it's just that I think the shape of it, when you've got a convertible top, makes the car look different. And, yeah, I, th I think that's about my favourite my favourite car that I've, I've ever had, really. I, I do take care of that one. Swanning around in something like that car was everything you dreamed, uh, dreamed of. I mean, it was um, second only, I suppose, to being on top of the pops. So we've got a, um, a Porsche uh, Cayenne, which is really for the wife to go shopping with and <laughs> bring my Peroni home. <laughs> which is really important. 
Well, it's important for me. I, I mean, I drink a lot of beer and get into a car after drinking as many beers as I want. <laughs> Still got a, 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 an XKR Jaguar. Um, but I gave that to the wife, to be honest with you. When I got the Bentley, I, 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 it was a bit mean if I'd sort of had two convertibles to myself. She went, what about me having that? So I said, OK. See, so I am very generous. Yes, yeah, so my sort of thing with cars is sort of like bookend it in quite an interesting way with, um, you know, the uh, Bentley 1949 Bentley at one side and um, the Sinclair C5 at the other. I've got an Audi A8. All the other autobiographies were... Base, I'd read about people who were basically blaming the record companies and the management for the reason for their downfall. I thought it was funnier to actually have the record companies and the managers as the good guys, and, um, you know, I would take all the blame and responsibility for everything that I managed to mess up in my life, which was a lot. It's an old one. I mean, I've had it for 12 years, but it's, I mean, it's done maybe 50,000 miles. And so I wrote this book, and the um, publisher said, they're going to call it Rock and Roll's Greatest Failure. Right. So then I had to go and promote myself as Rock and Roll's greatest failure. But, you know, you, I think you do need something that you can leave at the train station overnight. You know, if you, 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 you get, get on the train and you think, oh, I've had a few beers, I'll leave the car tonight. You know, you're not worried about it so much. Whereas if it was the Bentley or the, the Ferrari or something like that, you'd go, whoa, you'd be nervous. And then recently I was watching a television programme and on came a Sinclair C5. And uh, I thought there was some synchronicity between Rock and Roll's Greatest Failure and Clive Sinclair's Sinclair C5. So I thought I ought to get one of those because I'd look, you know, good driving around in that. Yes, but it's an old car now, but it's, it's still, I would say, the most reliable. I think I've had one thing go wrong with it, and that was the, um, the uh, thermostat. I think I'd just finished a bottle of wine. And what happens when you, th or what happens with me when you sort of think those things, when you watch that sort of documentaries, you think, um, where's my laptop? Dial in eBay and find out how much a Sinclair C5 costs. And there was one there. And the great thing about things like eBay is the fact that you can just buy it straight away. And I did. And I remember when the thermostat used to go funny on the Cortina, it used to cost you four quid. This cost £1,800 to have a thermostat changed because they have to take the front of the engine off. It's classified as an electric bicycle. Um, Clive Sinclair did it so that you could drive it around like an electric bicycle, which meant people like me that didn't have a licence could actually have the thrill of going onto the road driving something. So, but apart from that, that's the only thing that's ever gone wrong with it, and I, I love it. I, I was doing Edinburgh Festival, and I don't know if you know what Edinburgh Fringe Festival is like, but it's basically loads and loads and loads of people handing out flyers, trying to advertise their shows, and millions of people just trying to get people into their shows, because there's thousands of shows. And So what I did, I just put Otway on the side of my Sinclair C5 and drove around Edinburgh. And everybody was going, it's a Sinclair C5! It's a Sinclair C5. And fathers would tap their children onto the, um, on the shoulder and go, do you know what that is? That is a Sinclair C5. And as you pulled up the traffic lights, um, people would stop and take your photograph and say, can I have a selfie with your Sinclair C5? And the only annoying thing about all that was the fact that um, the Sinclair C5 was more famous than I was. Well, there are few musicians more famous than John Lennon. Time to look at his remarkable Rolls Royce Phantom 5. We're standing next to John Lennon's original uh, uh, 1965 Rolls-Royce Phantom 5. Uh, it's an icon of the 20th century. Uh, this is the first time this car has been on the streets of London since 1969.
Sean walked into a Rolls Royce dealership and said, what's the biggest automobile you have? And they said, the Phantom 5, sir. Uh, and he said, great, I'll take one. He wanted a radio telephone. He wanted these darkened windows for privacy. A double bed went inside, a portable electric refrigerator. Uh, the idea emerges to paint the car. And he meets a young British artist called Steve Weaver, who draws up panels for him, uh, gets approval, buys some pots of house paint, disappears into the coach building shop in Chertsey, and begins to paint the car. And so this is Steve Weaver's work. And it's delivered nine days before the press conference for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. It's also a symbol that says this is the power of the counterculture. Here we are, we're not going away. An extraordinary ride. So what about speed? Do we feel the need? Do I like to drive fast? Yes, I do. Um, but in the right sort of conditions. Wild Willie Barrett um, was my partner, John Otwell and Wild Willie Barrett, we had the hit with. The first thing he spent his money on was um, a Jaguar XJ12. You know, everyone sort of seems to sort of creep over the sort of speed limit on a motorway and stuff like that. And if there's nothing around, then I think that's quite acceptable. He was a sort of petrol head and things. And that was an absolute monster of a vehicle. Um, I don't really get in trouble for saying this now, but he used to sort of like bomb up and down the M1 and the M6 at 120 miles an hour. And that XJ12, no police car could keep up with it. You know, the 70 mile an hour limit is really ridiculous, I think. It was an astonishing vehicle. I mean, my Audi will stop in an eighth of the distance of something that was made in 1965. I remember coming down the M6 in that car, and there's this like gentle bends, but 120 miles an hour, you were going, <laughs> like that. I mean, I've had some great times on, on tracks and things like that. But I think Willie got rid of the um, XJ12 round about the same time I had to get rid of the Bentley. You know, a friend of mine lent me his, <laughs> his, his GTR, his Nissan GTR, and uh, it's a, it was like a stage three GTR, so it was like, it was somewhere around about 850 brake horsepower. I mean, absolutely a, a monster of a car. And I was actually really destroying 358 Ferraris and, and stuff like that. And I got past this Ferrari and I've gone round the bend and it's about 100, 155 miles an hour. And I've looked in the mirror to see where the Ferrari was. And as I did, I've sort of gone over and I hit the grass and the thing just spun and spun and spun. And I just remember just looking and seeing these, this tire wall just coming towards me. And so lucky, but the, 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 the gravel pit really did its job and I stopped just before them. But unfortunately, I, I really wrecked the car because I wasn't thinking and I still had my foot on the accelerator and it did the whole gearbox in, so... Sorry about that, Neil. Well, the worst thing that happened in the Bentley was um, one of my mates, you we were on tour, and it was quite a big tour, and we, you know, it was after the big hit, so we were staying in really nice hotels. My mate drove me up to the front of the hotel and um, I pointed out to him that they couldn't see the car from the reception and this was actually quite important because what was the point in having the car if the, the receptionist didn't see you turn up in it? So I said, you're just going to have to reverse back a bit. And he thought I was being a bit sort of like over the top. So he slammed it into reverse and smashed into the car behind. And then the receptionist did notice the Bentley for all the wrong reasons. Let's end by asking our guests what their dream car would be. Um, I think there's one last thing I'd like to get, that's an R8. I remember as a teenager, being 16 years old, um, hitching to see my girlfriend, and um, this E-type Jag pulled out. It reminds me of the GTS, the little Ferrari that I've got, but it's 
you know, it's a lot more comfortable, it's a lot more quiet, it's got power steering. Driving this little 328 is like driving a go-kart. Got into the seat time jack and it roared away. And I was always thinking, um, Afterwards, you know, you, you sort of think, what a generous guy that was. He's got, you know, an E-type Jag and he's stopped to give you a lift. And it's only when I get to this age when I realise he wasn't being generous at all. He just got an E-type Jag and wanted to show off. It'd be nice to have a sports car that you can take out every day because you don't want to drive a 328 every day. It just It would take the value off of it. And like I said, it's only done like four and a half thousand miles. So I'm keeping it as a... I'll give it as a family heirloom to one of the kids, maybe. So. What a nice heirloom. Coming up next week on Rock and Roll Cars, the Onyx, Lamborghini Aventador and the E-Type Jaguar. Legends, Tony Hadley. Sky Blue, Vauxhall Viva. Go West. Oh, oh, yeah, jazz. Jazz. And Carol Decker to Powell. But if you look in your rearview mirror, my eyes are this big. <laughs>